Hey guys. And we are here. Live. live. Virtually live. Virtually That's live. Right. And the best part is, Brian, we can hear Sammy loud and clear. Coming exactly. No more, no more audio <laughs> issues. We're, we're, we're all upgrading here. Yeah, we Get a little uh, bit of we, bass in the voice now. We upgraded our A V department, so uh yeah. some some nice new uh some nice new tech in here. He's got he's got a pool background you know, going on, so he's he's good to go. Nice. Oh, yeah, Brian Brian's rocking the Yeti, so yeah. If we can't be really in person, we'll make here. it as best as we can. So Yeah. A little sniffle today. It definitely has uh gotten a little worse, but hey, it is what it is. Rock and roll. So yeah, we have a interesting week of kind of cyber news. I mean, outside of the uh, you know, some of the cybersecurity incidents, I think everyone's been talking about you know Twitter and a few things. So if we have some time, we'll kind of touch upon that. Talk a little bit about some uh, some potential bounties that are out there that are interesting that we've touched on before. And then um, I have a question I'll kind of throw up a little bit later. We can kind of walk through that and kind of see what that one looks like and uh, get some get some good conversation going. So. Um, I don't know if you guys want, let's maybe dive into the whole, you know, let's call a bounty program and, you know, um, like what the government's kind of asking for from a, you know, uh, some of this intelligence on some, let's call it legacy, you know, ransomware that was out there for quite a while. Um, they're announcing a, a $10 million bounty for some Russian intelligence um, that were known to be involved in this uh, essentially exploit that have been rampant for many, many years now. Um, you know, kind of coming around a little bit, I don't want to say late to the game, but, you know, now we're kind of seeing this continued effort of, you know, cyber crimes and cyber criminals kind of being brought to the forefront, if you will, for, you know, massive damages to the U.S., to the infrastructure, you know, how, how destructive this, uh, this, this malware was. I think it was, you know, estimated at over like a billion dollars in damages over the years. So pretty, pr pretty major deal, right? So, um, you know, like, what do you guys think about this kind of continued trend of seeing the, the, like these bounties and, you know, bug programs, if you will, around, you know, cyber criminals versus, you know, <laughs> FBI's most wanted now is less about maybe mobsters and more about cyber criminals is what it seems like almost. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it allows the these agencies to kind of uh, crowdsource talent and, and um potentially get access to uh, individuals who they normally wouldn't have access to. You know, you know the thing about bureaucracies is they move rather slowly. Um, and so I think they, I, this was detected back in 2017. They were indicted in 2020. Uh, and they're just now releasing the $10 million reward or the program for the $10 million reward. So uh, it's a five-year timeline. Um, and these, you know, these these threat actors have been very active since then. Since they're, they're part of the GRU, uh, they're they're quite active right now in uh, Ukraine and, um, and and performing attacks against uh, their power grids and um, their uh, you know other critical infrastructures. So uh, yeah, I, I I would say uh, um, certainly this this type of program is uh, very beneficial for get, gathering other talent to, in order to identify these perps. Um, and, you know, at the, at the same time, uh, I think it helps them kind of speed up their own process, which uh, you could see, you know, with five years lead time. Um, by that time, it's like how many other critical events have, have occurred, right? Um, so just just a couple of different perspectives there. So, so let me ask you, like, do you think this is coming out more so now because of the, let's just say, tensions around Russia, Ukraine? Are more people willing to say, "Hey, you know what? I might give up information for some money, due to everything else happening." Um, I think there's uh, the, it, definitely a lot of it has to do with the the tensions, the current rising tensions overseas. If with when we see these same operatives, um, the ones that were recently affiliated with you know units like the Sandworm unit uh, that that are part of the GRU, um, working in other areas it increases the you know working on other pieces of malware working on attacking other uh systems you it increases the incentive to not only capture these perps especially when they have history of of doing these types of things but um you know i i think for the most part yeah these the these types of uh these types of programs kind of help dial in um with i guess dial in efforts um toward, towards capturing a lot of these guys so um 
yeah, no, I, I, I got, I think I got off on a tangent there, but that's um, good though. We're all, <laughs> we're, all, we're all here for it. That's what makes it good. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, no, but to, what are your thoughts on that, Brian? So $10 million is kind of leveling up a little bit. You can get maybe somebody to deflect from a group and cough them up. Possibly. I was also interested to know, are they going to pay it in Bitcoin? Yeah. Or yeah. is it like a wire transfer of $10 million or, or what from that perspective? And then I learned something new. I did not know the State Department had a, a tour site. Yeah, that was so interesting. I know that now. Um, so I, it makes sense, right? You got to be on the communication channels that the, the attackers use. So that was kind of interesting to learn. But I mean, if you look at the damage that was done, a billion dollars of estimated damages to the Chernobyl yeah. monitoring system, um, that that was huge. And so $10 million is just a drop in the bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, th- I think that's a great point. Is is the financial incentive when when you kind of do the the, the back of uh, napkin math, you, you kind of see uh, the the, uh, the impact of it not only uh, in in foreign entities but at home with uh, several of our organizations uh, to feeling the blunt of that impact. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. And and, and ten million dollars is a pretty small investment to hopefully you know. Uh, get prevent further damage or at least maybe get some reparations as, as part of the, the damages caused by these groups. Yeah. I think also what's, what's interesting is like, you know, this is just kind of one, you know, section, if you will, coming out of this, but if you, if you kind of read through the article, you know, it talks about, I think it was, so they've paid out more than it looks like $200 million or so to like a, over like a hundred different, you know, tipsters as they call them uh, since this program launched. It also mentions, you know, like in February, there was another announcement for the reward around some other hackers who are working on, you know, alleged state sponsored um, attacks for the uh, election and and things like that. So I think we're going to kind of continue to see this trend now where the governments and state departments, if you will, are going to kind of, like you said, pony up and start offering more um, because, you know, it, it is a small price to pay for what's really happening in the whole kind of global crime scheme if you will so maybe these numbers kind of go up and up a little bit more to be like yeah i'm like you know what maybe maybe instead of 10 million is 20 million and that makes it even harder for someone to be like yeah you know for that i I might kind of give somebody up or give some information up right so um it's kind of that uh how do we entice people to you know uh chip if you will or kind of inform on certain things so um yeah very interesting so is it like the lottery where more people that cough it up, the less the reward is? Because I guess they have to divide yeah. it up. So if you yeah, go into a lottery work. pool, yeah, all of a sudden it's not worth as much. Maybe it's so. a one and done, you know, t- time time to market. First one there wins. <laughs> right, right. Or maybe it has to have meet certain criteria to, to count as, uh, as uh, rewardable information. Yeah, it's like how they validate that, right? Like, are they going to be like, hey, like, here's some random information. His name is Brian Gibbs. You give me $10 million. You know, I don't know, but uh, I'm just kidding. I'm sure I there's suppose a lot more that the that. information has to, to one, two, three, four, Main Street. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> yeah. Phone I guess, number is I guess like the, 12 digits. The, the uh, info has to probably lead to, uh, you know, the, 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 either the identification of the location or maybe, you know, arrest of the individual um, for it to be qualified, I imagine. Well, the other thing, too, is like, let's say like like you are the one coming forward, like you're going to want some pretty hefty guarantees that like you stay anonymous and your identity stays, you know, covert, if you will, depending on which kind of circles you're really riding in. Right. So that's a whole other piece to this. Yeah, exactly. Point. You'd be definitely Something. make yourself a target when you're. Uh, ratting out some of these some of these guys so i guess that's what the tour link or the tour site is for it's like the new modern mobsters right i mean you it was the whole snitch in the rat kind of factor and you know go to the, the whole back of the house but now it's all done via tour channels and anonymous links and, and things like that so yeah and, and we actually just had a, a comment it's actually up to up to 60 mil since there were there there really have uh identified six perps involved um that they're looking to to, to capture um, and 10 mil for each of them. So it's actually up to a six oh, so mil in total. That's yeah. a pretty good little take home right there, man. Rat out two yeah. or three of them and 
now you're talking a little bit more people will be like hmm okay well i think it's pretty cool that the state department's even offering this i think we're going to see more and more of this as we continue on to help take down some of these rings yeah and it, and it kind of almost plays into what we talked about before it's like the whole you know hack back for hacking type of a thing too this is just another form to help kind of cure and curb you know cyber crime throughout you know as it's running so rampant right now as we all see it it's like hacking vigilanteism yeah it's kind of rewarding in it in a funny way <laughs> right it's like the <laughs> one area where where vigilanteism is is culturally accepted is in the, the, world, the cyber world but it makes sense because uh often talent doesn't work for the bureaucracies they work independently um yeah yeah so another one that's kind of uh, going a little bit kind of blast to the past here if we kind of keep on this trend is uh everyone's favorite uh uh emotet you know um botnet malware has been testing and trying to uh kind of come out of hiding a little bit there and seeing um if there's ways they can kind of start to kind of get back in the game start bypassing some of the rules and getting around some of these um locks that they've had to deal with you know through microsoft and a few other people so um you know it's kind of one of those like nothing really ever goes away in, in cyber crime it kind of just gets recycled tweaked and tuned and respun if you will and tries to become as rampant as ever so you know these things will kind of just go crawl off in a corner and die they're they're always going to be living with us always kind of coming around um so yeah it's just it's just interesting that you know we're seeing this He's kind of blast in the past, if you will, things that don't go away. I'm um, still very rapid running in the. Well, what's uh, interesting the about security. that too is that you know they're not it, 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 historically speaking. This malware was kind of used in mass, um, especially particularly from the the research group the, the article is referring to. Um, they 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 would typically kind of launch this um, without any kind of evasion or without being very stealthy against a large volume of. Uh, or a large uh, number of uh, targets. In this situation, what we're seeing is a, a more targeted approach where they're actually uh, tweaking the malware to bypass third-party controls and uh, in defenses. So we're seeing a much more targeted uh, and complex strain of this uh, of this malware, which is uh, you know a change from how we've seen it used in the past, um, you know, in volume, in large volumes. So um that's that's something that's kind of curious to note about this uh re-emergence of uh, uh of this uh of this malware strain well and ingraining it into microsoft's cloud and making it simple and easy to consume and OneDrive links i mean that's easy people yeah. expect that in today's world working in the cloud and remotely and people getting rid of file servers and wanting to share stuff excel files pretty common for a lot of people to use and and whatnot. So I think it takes that guard back down and then you're back to the people process yeah. um, issue of making sure that they're trained and are vigilant to the things that they should and shouldn't be doing. Like personally, when a shared and I'm guilty of sending them uh, sharing a link through SharePoint or whatever, and you get the email, I never click on that. I go to the SharePoint site and go find the file. Manually navigate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's always that kind of trust but verify, you know, thing you see. And it's kind of funny about the whole macro thing. I remember seeing this. I forget where I saw it originally. It's been years and years, but it's like someone said, "Hey, I want to change my my little macro pop up that says, um, do you accept, you know, infecting your PC, yes or no?" Versus like enabling <laughs> macros. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, what does this mean? Maybe I don't want to click <laughs> this button. You know, make makes you think before just like, yeah, that sounds fine. Just click through it. So. Like you said, you're you're now playing on these more advanced tactics. You're you know playing to the 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 uh, human firewalls we kind of call them, right? Yeah, I think I think naturally the the game tends to elevate, and as a result, it's you know the the uh, using that kind of spray and pray approach is, is becoming less and less lucrative as we uh, start to encounter more and more complex defenses. Um, so yeah, it, it makes sense that the developers have started to become far more targeted in their approach. You know, we even see that as a uh, uh, in the white hat uh, industry of of just you know ethical hacking. Um, that that we're starting to see the the complexity uh, within you know your average environment uh, increasing. So uh, yeah, it's just it's kind of also indicative of uh, 
the growth and innovation that we've seen in the past few years in the industry. Yeah, it's kind of like you kind of constantly have to be, you know, evolving, right? Whether it's the offensive or defensive, it happens on both sides, you know, black and or white hat, depending on, you know, how you want to look at this, right? Good versus bad. Um, you know, it's, it's the kind of con- constant cat and mouse game we always tend to talk about. And, you know, even just tweaking a little bit of things can go a long way. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to, like, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. It's just modifying the process or the control you're attacking or the people you're attacking or the the timing of the attack, things like that can all make a really huge, significant uh, impact. So, yeah. Agreed. Definitely. The other one I, I'm always curious about, and I've always, you know, maybe we can have a whole a show on this, is like who gets to name all these really fancy <laughs> threat groups like mummy spider, you know, wizard spider, like, I don't know. I've always wondered, yeah. like, you know, who's sitting in the room saying, like, I'm going to call this X, Y, Z and just get these, like, crazy names out there. So, you know, Fancy Bear. I don't know. It always kind of cracks me up. So yeah. It's a marketing I'll... group. They used to work at a company called VMware that used to change the <laughs> names of their products every <laughs> six months just so they could sell yeah. a new SKU, right? That's kind of funny. They've right. moved yeah, on I... now, and they get to name the, the cyber criminals. Yeah. O- it's, often, it's, it's if, awesome. it, if they don't kind of, like, you know, develop that reputation through their postings on the dark net and whatnot. It's, I think generally provided by the, the researchers that discover uh, the, the APT or, or that series of behavior. And then over time, yeah. they, 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 they tend to, to brand it as such. Usually the, the group is kind of named after the, the type of stuff that they would do. Um, not always, but oftentimes they're kind of reflective of, of, of their nature. So, so what does a, a wizard spider do? Just kidding. Never seen it. Yeah, right. Before. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> a wizard spider. Yeah. A little bit of off topic there, but I always thought that was interesting. Like some of the names you, you like we come across and see and, you know, it's just a little, a little fun side to it sometimes, right? So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then uh, another great point from the audience here is uh, oftentimes um, different groups will have different names for the, for the same group. So. Uh, oh, yeah. You may see different naming conventions across different organizations researching them. Uh, that won't get too confusing at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely some, be some, maybe some standardization there. But uh, I guess if we had standardization, maybe we wouldn't have cool names like Wizard Spider. Yeah, um, so. I approve. Just thought it was always kind of interesting and funny. So, got to have right. some fun with it. <laughs> so, I have a question for you guys. I want to actually share a poll. Um, that I did on LinkedIn recently. So I I want you guys to guess the results and no cheating because you guys can go find this real time. So I basically asked um, the people of LinkedIn, my, my, like one of our favorite questions about uh, backups, meaning do you test restore your backups? Yes, no, or uh, the other option is what backups? So if you guys had to put a number on it, you know, 50, 50 split, you know, things like that, what would you say is yes versus no? 64% 60-40? Okay. I, I was yeah. The the cynic in me wanted to go a little higher and, and say I, right. I would say probably like seventy to eighty percent probably All don't. Right, let me share it. the result real quick. It's still rolling, but um, kind of can give you the idea here. So yeah, so far you know it's a little okay. bit maybe misleading about the what backups. I'm sure people are kind of having fun with it, but uh, I'm yeah. a little surprised the uh, no, but I should is actually the high as it is, right? Um, so I just think that's, uh, I thought that was an interesting poll to kind of to see with everything we have kind of going on right now, we have a lot of customers kind of asking us about backup strategies, retention and, you know, crown jewels, if you will, of what they should back up. So it kind of prompted me to post this and kind of see what's out there. But I think what's kind of telling in this is like, there is still people that legitimately have kind of told me like, yeah, I don't really test my backups or test restore my backups and, and things like that. So it's, uh. You know, just something to kind of be aware of and you know we, we kind of beat this horse to death on the show but it's something basic it's something simple it's like that's great you back it up but do you actually test and know how to restore your data if something were to happen so do you start that's a stopwatch when you start the restore process uh, that's a good question to see how long it actually takes you well yeah you might have a four-hour sla and think that you can actually meet it i want to see it 
Yeah, that, that, that's a right. really good point is we've actually had, you know, customers we've helped over the years and they say, hey, like, you know, I have backup. I want to restore it. And they start the process and it's like, oh, well, I didn't realize I have to like do this first or get this person or only so and so can do this. And like you said, that four hours turns into like three days. It becomes a big issue. Right. Have you rehearsed the order in which everything needs to come back up? Have you rehearsed to ensure that you have access to everything you need, like external DNS? IP addressing, all that stuff right. in advance, firewalls already pre-configured, all those things that tend to derail you. And then all of a sudden you spent five hours on the line with support because something wasn't working and none of the other systems are back up and running yet. It just That's happens, true. right? Yeah. So I don't think that it's probably over 2% of people that actually do it end to end. I remember yeah. hearing a story one time where UPS, they rotate their data center every six months. I don't know if they still do this or not, but they would fail it over to the other data center. They ran out of it for six months. And then six months later, they would fail it back and they ran out of it for the six months. That's a great way to, to validate your systems that's and a, that they that's work. A, that's, a, that's a great strategy because then like you're, you're literally testing business continuity, DR, end to end. Um, you know, that your, your, your confidence level will be off the chart if you could actually do stuff like that. Right. Right. Like talking to a customer yesterday. Oh yeah. We have Veeam and it backs up everything. Okay. So what happens if your data center goes away or whatever and come to find out they maybe have some legacy systems and I'm like, well, those systems aren't going to boot up in AWS and, and Azure. Yeah. So now you got to start planning another alternative option and you need to have that in place now because you're not going to meet a four, L, four hour SLA when you have to sign a contract. And how are you going to issue a PO when it's down? Right. Forces you to kind of rethink things for sure. So Exactly. Yeah, all Kind of all the unforeseen co cost of impact uh, there that you don't really think about when you're... Uh, when you're test when you're creating your backups, but um, I guess that's why so many people uh, kind of fail to uh, estimate cost accurately when it when it comes time to these things, is they underestimate that up uh, that cost of downtime. They make a lot of assumptions around that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So okay. Well, it's hard to look at historical data because how often do you really get hacked, right? So and, and it varies so differently from org to org. So you can't really use Target or T-Mobile's data as a as a uh, accurate metric moving into the future for what you think your uh, recovery time would be so um it's also hard to to, to kind of estimate that from a, a risk management perspective yeah that's true so guys maybe we kind of wrap with it, wrap this one up with one more kind of topic it's kind of all over the news i'm not sure if you've if you've heard just kidding um it's been all over the whole twitter verse and you know, Elon buying Twitter and this and that. But I think we want to kind of take a different approach to this, you know, not so much what that means from him buying it, but, you know, the whole concept of him open sourcing, if you will, kind of like the code and, and the logarithms and kind of what that means. And I think Sammy and Brian, you guys were kind of saying you had some interesting kind of thoughts around what that can mean from a security perspective, how people can kind of, kind of start to gain the system, so to speak, and learn how to, you know, manipulate the data, maybe even more so now. Yeah, if you open source that code, it will be easy to figure out how to reverse engineer getting your posts to go higher. So I should, I while I was sitting here thinking, it's like I should hurry up and go find some domain names to register, start a marketing firm on the side that can help boost your your Twitter score, if you will, within it. But I, I mean, it is a serious concern uh, from that aspect. And then all the vulnerabilities in the code and stuff, like I just hope they're going to do some amount of code review and some other things. If they do go down that path to open source, um, everything in that aspect. Yeah. I, I think we've seen that not just because it's open source doesn't necessarily mean that it's more secure. I think like, you know, when you look at like log four J that was yeah. probably like one of the most mm -hmm. obvious ones in recent memory that shows you like, Hey, you know, there were there are plenty of opportunities for the developers to audit and discover that uh, part of the code, but it wasn't. Um, and so, yeah, to 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 Brian's point, now they're going to be able to easily discern, you know, how does the algorithm work? How are they recommending certain content? Um, and then bypass the the, the spam bot filters. Um, right. So it's kind of a a two way game, but w I, I guess what it does is. Um, allow room for innovation in that area and 
because you know because if it's closed source as much as you know you you're you're not finding out about your potential vulnerabilities as much as you are you know allowing those to be uh um, as much as you are keeping them secure. So, you know, by opening that up, um, you, you do allow for a push and innovation there. Also with, you know, Elon coming from an AI company like Tesla, um, I'm curious to see what retasking some of those engineers will mean for, you know, leveraging AI to combat that. Um, right. Cause that's something that not a lot of individual threat actors have access to like Elon does so that's that's a big pool you know so a big pool of data to pull from um in order to be able to combat something like that yeah yeah and i also think you know someone with his kind of you know status and stature whether you like him or don't like him it doesn't matter like he does pull a lot of people that will just you know like like want to go work for him and and like a lot of great talent right he's had from his other companies so you know hopefully you can get a lot of good you know, cross pollination, if you will, from the various other entities and engineers he has access to and really want to kind of transform this and make it, you know, for the, the greater good, so to speak. And like you're saying, Sam, you know, open source doesn't necessarily always mean secure because we've seen this where, you know, bad code gets injected and downloaded and pushed. And then you know, here you are months later, still cleaning up little surfaces that are running, you know, log4j is a, a great example of that whole thing. So interesting to see what happens yeah well my favorite feature i hope that comes alive would be the edit feature right Let's see what are happens we, oh is are we not able to edit existing tweets right now you can I'm delete them people. but okay. you can't edit just, it just just delete so post and delete basically is about it yeah that, that, you know getting off the a tan, getting on a tangent here yeah i am curious to see how like the actual nature of the platform will change like will 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 it be more profile based where you can, you know, upload content? Because his intention is to compete with uh, other platforms like Instagram and Facebook. Right now, Twitter kind of has like a different format um, for yeah. their for their social media and like, in, you know, presenting their content. I'm really curious if that presentation is going to change or um, how much it will just kind of stay the same. Um, not really That's related to cybersecurity, but just just interesting to think about. How much yeah, Twitter point. slash Tesla integration versus SpaceX and, you know, Twitter can send a tweet out when you're on your way home now and this and that, right? So. I was going to say, out. can I just tweet my directions? <laughs> yeah. Tweet at, at, at your Tesla. It'll come pick you up. So. Nice. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think uh, we covered quite a bit today. Um, always a good pleasure to catch up and, you know, we'll kind of continue to, uh, turn these things out for our, our, our audience here and be sure to like, subscribe, follow along. If you have certain topics, post them. We'll check them out and keep the show rolling. Sounds Absolutely. good. Yep. Hit that like and subscribe button. And thanks for tuning in. All right. Take, take care, care. Everybody. Bye guys. Bye.